So this panel discussion um, relates to our latest theatre production, which is called The Long Lie, which is a working title. And that's exploring the care system in the UK for older people. And it's very much in a research and development phase towards creating a devised piece for a theatre production which will premiere in 2023. And a key part of the process to date has been gathering stories and testimony from different people who have experience of care for older adults. And as part of that, we've produced two seasons of a podcast, which is called Home From Home. And we would definitely recommend, if you haven't listened to it already, then please do take a listen. You'll find that on our website under the podcast page. And our chair tonight, Kazaya, produced a second series, and Ramses and Savita, who are two of our panelists this evening, were also featured. So do take a listen to that and we'll pop a um, link to that in the chat. We're really, really excited to host this event this evening. We've been planning this for a while and it's just a great moment for us to share and hear from some of the people working at the forefront of this really interesting and important field. Um, so yeah, now it remains for me to hand over to Kazar and I hope you enjoy tonight's panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks for that, Polly. Yes, hello, people. Welcome to the space. I hope everyone's well. And yeah, thank you for being here tonight. Really excited about this one. Um, my name is Kazaya, and I'll be chairing this discussion. And tonight we're going to be talking about the needs of older adults and what considerations need to be made when elders find themselves in a more vulnerable stage of their lives. Um, yeah, firstly, I've got, a, yeah, forgive me, I've got a bit of a cold at the moment. So if I sound a bit bunged up, it's because of Storm Eunice. Um, but yeah, we're really pleased to have such an amazing panel tonight, spanning from professors, campaigners and CEOs, and each person has a unique experience and expertise on the care system. So I'll do some introductions and then we'll dive straight into um, the questions. So on the panel tonight, we have David Sherd, who worked for 14 years as a social worker in hospital and community settings, specialising in dementia care and mental health. So David set up Dementia Care Matters and was the founder and CEO for 23 years, becoming a global pioneer and leader in culture change, focusing on improving the quality of life for older people living with dementia. And he is currently a professor of emotional intelligence at York St. John University. Next on the panel, we have Ramses Underhill-Smith, who is an entrepreneur and managing director of Alternative Care Services which is the UK's first independent LGBTQI plus domiciliary care provider. Ramses is a passionate campaigner for LGBTQI rights and a transgender black man who worked alongside the British Red Cross, Opening Doors London and FTM London to name a few charities. And our final panelist tonight is Sabitha Fagarathan who is a published author and was named one of Bristol's 100 most inspiring women in the South, sorry, in the West in 2018. And since 2014, Sabita shifted her focus on tackling stigmas around dementia, ensuring older people of South Asian and Caribbean origins were heard and took up a research associate position at UE Bristol in 2016. Sabita has worked in the, in the field of mental health, diabetes prevention, and managing chronic pain, trying to improve the knowledge and awareness in multi-ethnic communities in the UK. Right, I'm sure we've all heard a, a, enough of my voice now. So we're gonna jump into the first question. And as a way of personally introducing us to the space, um, an open question to the panel, what made you guys want to do what you do in the world of care? Um, David, would you like to answer first? Yeah, uh, and uh, it's often not a simple answer, is it? So I'll try and be quite quick, because when I thought about it, I thought of six factors. I think the first one was about vulnerability, understanding as a child that people were vulnerable. Uh, my father died of a heart attack when I was eight years old, and I began to get a sense that uh, not everyone had a long life. I think secondly, grandmothers who had experience of mental health and dementia while I was a teenager. I think thirdly, although I'm not religious now, uh, I was brought up very much uh, in Methodism. 
And Methodism at the time in the 60s had a real social justice element to it. And so I was brought up to uh, expect to give back to society. I think fourthly, I was a suppressed gay teenager. And I knew that one piece of information about me would change everything and change everybody's perception of me. And I think I perceived that that was very parallel to like when someone gets a diagnosis of a health condition, including dementia, that suddenly people have a different view of who you are, even though you feel inside of the same person. And lastly, uh, when I was training uh, as a social worker, I had a great placement in a hospital, uh, Holroyd Infirmary, working with older people and people with dementia and, and felt a, a passion about it, a, a passion about the unfairness of the institutionalization of it all and a sense of why isn't this like the Empress Clause? Why isn't everybody screaming and shouting? It could all be different. Thanks for that, David. Um, Sabitha, do you want to jump in? Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I think for me, so um, as you said in my introduction, I made a definite choice in 2014 to start getting involved in work around um, dementia specifically um, relating to South Asian and Caribbean communities. And that was due to diagnosis in my wider family. And um, you know that, that insight of um, people firstly, maybe getting their heads around a, a diagnosis of a condition that hadn't really been talked about very much um, in our communities in this country, but also I'm Sri Lankan at home in Sri Lanka. Um, so, that part of it, but then the other part of it of um, the, the offer of services that were there, either for family care or supporting someone with dementia or the person with dementia themselves, that just not being taken up because of um, either lack of knowledge of them or mistrust of them because of histories, um, worries that there just wouldn't be that cultural sensitivity. And I think it's, it's those, two, those two prongs of um, the situation brought me to, to choose to, to work um, to focus on dementia. And also it has, it, in, in the history of the UK, been very um, stigmatized and hidden in, in a whole range of communities, including the white British community for a long time. But it was at a time when it was slowly being talked about a bit more because the prime minister at that time was David Cameron and he launched the dementia challenge. And it just the timing of that came together and there started to be more work around that. So there were opportunities for me and I think also I was reflecting upon it that in a way I'm very um, distant physically from my elders grandparents and great aunts and so on mainly at home still in Sri Lanka so in a way it kind of addressed that that gap for me um, of, of having a connection with because dementia doesn't just affect older people be clear about that but age is the greatest risk factor. So I have spent a lot of time with people of, um, who, are, who are older from minority ethnic communities. And in a way it, it filled that vacuum that I, I kind of increasingly felt as I got older that I was probably less aware of when I was younger. Thanks, Amitha. Um, and Ramses, so what made you want to do what you do? Um, I think uh, one of the main things for me was just, um, thinking about myself and my friends and what was going to happen to us. And as a, as a, as a black person, you know, there's a lot of, uh, in, in the African and Afro-Caribbean communities. And I, and I think in, in a lot of sort of, uh, non-white cultures, a, a lot of homophobia, transphobia, uh, but it's not that it's just there, it's there and it's kind of woven into, into the fabric of the culture. So it's okay to, to discriminate. And so, um, so, uh, you know, people get training and all that kind of stuff and they're told not to discriminate on, on uh, culturally, um, you know, I knew that there, there was going to be an issue. And I think one of the issues as well, I, 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 I came up against was if a lot of people, um, from your own culture work in the, in, in the, in the care industry as well, how are you going to protect yourself? Um, so part of the setting it up was partly, uh, to get the conversation going to, to make sure that you know these things are addressed in a, in a and we talk about culture but in a culturally specific way um so 
yeah, I've, you know, I've got my children and I thought, well, what's going to happen to me? I don't want my children looking after me, but then I don't want to be somewhere where I, I feel what, you know, where I felt stuff that I felt most of my life. So I felt ashamed, felt that you have to hide, you know, uh, and if, if, uh, if, uh, if a black man is in sort of, you know, South London being attacked by another black man for homophobia, there's very few places he's going to be able to turn on the street um, because, you know, it, it, you know, you're not going to really, um, you don't feel safe enough going to the establishment and that's the, the wider establishment, we've heard that. And, so, and then you have nowhere else to turn inside of your culture. So what's going to happen to you when you're fragile and when you're older? So yeah, and I saw some of my friends being discriminated against because they were HIV positive. You know, carers went into their homes and people wanted to use mops to wash them and, you know, people were praying over them and all of that. And, and, and I've even had that experience. You know, my, my sister was passing away and she was in a hospice and the pastor who knew us, both of us came in. My sister was on the last few weeks and they decided to pray for me first before they prayed for my sister even though I was healthy <laughs> and my sister was passing away, they decided that I needed saving much more than her. And so, and, and so that kind of thing, I realized it's not just, I just don't experience it because of my race, but we, we all have some levels of experience. And I think the older LGBT community as well come from an era where it was criminal to, to, to be out. So it's, it's, you know, a lot of people go back into the closet and I think that it's really, it's not, it's not acceptable for me to, you know, to think about the fact that when someone turns up to your house to care for you, you have to put all your, your pictures and everything away. You have to hide who you are because you're scared of what, what's going to happen. So that's kind of led me on my sort of like my, my quest, as it were. Okay, so thanks for that. Um, and yeah, by the way, I definitely want this to be a free flowing space. So if you guys want to bounce off each other, you know, um, please feel, feel free to. Um, but yeah, it sounds like it was personal reasons and experiences that have kind of launched you into the care system. So in your opinion, what are the most important qualities someone can have when caring for older adults? And I guess this time we'll go in reverse order. So Ramses, if you want to start first. Uh, you know, the willingness, I think there's, it, it, you know, I work in the industry and there's so many challenges in it um, and I think what you need to be a caregiver is when I say the willingness that means that you you know you're willing to learn you're willing to be taught empathy you're willing all the gaps that you don't have you're willing for somebody to be able to fill those gaps um, and that way you can grow so you know you're willing to join in you're willing to participate you're willing to understand what dementia is you're willing to understand what mental health is you're willing to understand what it is to be lgbt um, and not just think that i've had some training and i hear this all the time oh i've had the training uh, you know sit down at the computer for 90 minutes so i completely understand um you know and then people are still misgendered so it's i think you know you've got to have a real hope open heart um it's a really difficult job it's a really, really difficult job. And, you know, then, you know, in my opinion that, uh, you know, the people are not, the, the, the people who deliver care are not valued enough. And if they're not valued enough, and it's not just, they're not valued enough by the council or the local or the government. If people, if, if, it's, if, if there's an outward face or if there's this notion that you can not value something, it goes across, it has a knock on effect. And then that that lack of value for the carer, uh, you know, people, everybody understands, I'll just get a new carer. I'll just, you know, and so then you, you know, we, we see the breakdown in, in, in sort of emotional well-being of the, of the carers as well. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, you, you, you know, most most of the people that I know are they're so dedicated, you know, they're just they go above and beyond. Um, and that's what we need, but we also need to put things in place that are going to value these people that do this 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 work. Yeah, um, and maybe David, you could you could speak on that. I mean, kind of exploring some of the the conflicts between delivering that person centered care, but then how that might be in conflict with those day to day practicalities and the pressures that the carers are under, and some of the economic structures of the care system. Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing I heard from Ramses was the words open heart. Uh, and I think, yeah, the sector has 
got itself stuck in a lot of mechanistic competencies and, and frameworks around training. When I would say that there are three key ingredients, which links to Ramsey's comment about open heart. And I would say being someone who's inside out uh, is critical. Uh, what I mean by that is that someone who lives from the inside of them on the outside. Um, and a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people have a whole veneer on the outside that's not really who they are. But I think if you're going to work in health and social care, you have to, you have to work from the inside. And that means you have to be someone who's very genuine and authentic, which again is contrary to the society we're in. And you have to also be able to feel being in another person's shoes. But that, of course, is easier said than done to be those things in terms of authenticity, genuineness, being inside out, feeling another person's shoes. When you work in a large dispersed building for 150 people or when the power sharing within the care sector creates a them and us divide. Uh, and for years, I've talked about the problems of uniforms and people eating separately to the people who are living there. So there's, there's a whole structure that in terms of architecture, in terms of culture, them and us, power sharing, uh, private equity needing to raise profits for shareholders, that if you put, you know, the individual with the system, you know, I'm saying the individual needs to be someone working from the inside out on, in authenticity, but can often be working in a sector that although doing its best doesn't feel that authentic, doesn't quite feel like what we know inside matters most. And so as someone who's worked 40 years in the care sector and been part of it, it's not knocking the care sector, but it still is this case often of the emperor's clothes. Why is no one shouting out? It's not natural to live in these buildings. It's not natural to live in a separateness between the people giving care and receiving care. So there are a lot of structural uh, barriers that will have to still be worked on hard. And they have been worked on hard the last 25 years, but it shows how hard they are when all that work in the last 25 years means they're still needing more dismantling. And is, I mean, like, there must be a better way that the business can work more in harmony with giving that person centered care. Um, Sabitho, do you think you could comment on that at all? And I was going to follow up. There have been, my fellow panelists have mentioned a few times of, sort of structure. For me, I mean, one, one of my comments is around um, the structure set, set up. So, for example, pay and progression routes, the time people are given, people in paid care roles are given to really um, develop relationships, take time, get to know. And you know, I, I feel like that still isn't there. I mean, we've had uh, quite a long period, you know, in 2020, there was the regular once a week clapping for carers. And that was wonderful. And that was a change. But I, I've tried not to be a cynic, but I, a realist, a realist with optimism, but that feels like it was quite short lived to kind of where we are now in 2022 and actually how that translates into um, pay and, you know, that kind of long term job security and where, you know, in a climate where fuel prices are going up, how does that affect people who are driving around um, in paid care roles, um, as well as your general cost of living? I, I can't imagine how that is for people. In, in these roles that and it, it, at the wages that they are at. Um, so there's that structure. And then thinking more kind of around um, people. I was reminded when I was doing my dementia, um, carrying out my dementia research study at UE in 2016, I heard about a um, residential, uh, sorry, not residential, a day center in London. It might not still be operating, but it was um, particularly for um, older people of Jewish faith. And the majority of the workers in that centre weren't themselves of Jewish faith, but they just they had really educated, ed educated themselves, asked questions. I think the, the courage to say you don't know and ask questions in a sensitive way is is not valued enough. And we 
um, you know, there are cultural competency training course, courses and cultural sensitivity training courses, and maybe they're a start, but then they don't address everything for all the different nuances within communities and in between communities. But to have a, and a Laura Shackon from Bristol Black Carers is someone who really inspires me about actually, I'd rather you didn't go on so called cultural competency training, but you, you were able to ask questions in a sensitive way and you're asking them because you really care because you want that to affect your practice. And you know, that's what it was like in that day center. And here in Bristol, we have a um, residential home called Collier's Gardens. And there are, when there was real lobbying by the CEO of what was Bristol and Avon Chinese Women's Group and is now the Chinese Community Wellbeing Society. And she lobbied to make sure that a certain number of the, the, the properties within there the rooms or the, the little self-contained flats were um, designated for people of Chinese communities in the local area and uh, was successful. And from the start, as they were building that building, no one who was involved in it was of Chinese heritage, but they worked in partnership. They asked, how, what's, how do we have the light fittings? Because they had educated themselves that the shape of lights is very important in like feng shui culture. The numbers on doors, certain numbers are unlucky in, in Chinese cultures, colours. They, they ask these questions, even though the people involved in the, the planning development, none of them were of Chinese heritage. So they were from the starting point that we don't know and let's be authentic in how we develop this. And I don't think any of the staff there speak any of the relevant Chinese languages like Mandarin, but one of the staff members has been motivated to try and learn a bit. And there's a waiting list for these properties. And I, I have people from so many other communities saying, of minority ethnic communities saying, kind of, where's our place? And, you know, they're not, you know, including the South Asian communities where we're often told, oh, well, you know, your people don't go and look to be in places like that. But people are saying to me, where's our place? And they're not put off that it's kind of a, a sort of a white mainstream, if you like, service provider. And the staff team doesn't necessarily reflect the diversity of the Bristol population. but they're asking questions and listening properly and then adapting. Um, and I, I just exasperates me why when we have, there are many evidences of great practice that it, it's not, it, it, there's pockets. And could you explore how some of that, yeah, being a bit more culturally sensitive and aware could contribute towards uh, the well-being of older adults? Um, so then, Kind of the other side of the coin is um, I was hearing it's a couple of years ago now, but of an older Bristolian man of Caribbean origins and probably of the, the generation people use the, the maybe sloppy term, but sort of the Windrush generation. So had come over around that period of time and he had to go into um, a residential care home and um, all the pictures on the walls in this care home were of very kind of typical English rolling Cotswold countryside um, settings and he was very unsettled by this he has had dementia so already there was an impact with the move and there was nothing he recognized around him as far as you know the imagery and the colors and um, some of the people in the, the older people's um, Caribbean group um, who knew him, I think they fundraised themselves, sold some of their quilts and so on, and bought a picture um, for him to have in his room or in the corridor outside his room that was much more of an, 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 a physical environment that he recognised from, from his youth um, in the Caribbean. It might have been Jamaica that he was from. And I think that awareness, you know, you can call it conscious or unconscious bias of how you choose to to have you know you know even the physical environment what you've got on the walls as well as perhaps what you have on the menu and the things you make available for people to eat their meals with there could be a lot more done around that yeah does anyone else want to jump in i think you know one of the one of the things the challenges i find around sort of care homes and um the, is the is is the one size is it's not, it's not that the people that are working there don't you know don't want to do differently but I think like what you know what I've heard is about being open and, and and wanting to to learn new things but it is very much around understanding that we we, we are diverse and it, it and all white people aren't the same you know and so 
you know, we, we, we've got to start thinking about, we talk about personal centered care, we've got to start thinking about not just the individual who are in there, but also in terms of the workers, allowing them to be themselves, getting diverse workers in. And that, you know, it, what I've come across in terms of our, in our doms, domiciliary care is a lot of the staff have come back, sort of left and come back. And because when they go to another provider, all the homophobic comments are there, all the, and so that, if that's been what you hear in, in the sort of like the, 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 the management, you know, how is it, what's that going to filter down to? So, you know, uh, thinking about someone with dementia, uh, there, was, there was someone we came across who had a brain injury and had to go into a care home. Um, and the, the, they, they said the person had challenging behavior and was violent. But of course, the, even with dementia, you remember smell, you remember sounds, you, you know, it's like a baby. I say this to people, you know, a baby doesn't cry because they want you to pick them up. They cry because they know that when you pick them up, there's something that makes them comfortable, whether it's your heartbeat or the way you smell or the way you sound. And that's exactly what it's like. So, you know, if, if those things are addressed, if we sort of saw, looked at those things in terms of what people need, then we would, I think it'd be a lot less challenging because, you know, then to be labeled challenging um, because you, you have no voice. And David, um, how have you kind of yeah, used the physical environment and those home comforts in dementia uh, care matters? How did you how, how did you incorporate some of that, those ideas? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'll come quickly back to that. Uh, two things I'd like to quickly respond to. Uh, one is to say, you know, there are some providers out there who realised this is also about pay. I was really heartened to hear one provider announced a couple of weeks ago that they'd increased the pay by 30%. Uh, and they'd, in recognition, uh, in the sense of the hollowness of clapping for heroes without actually also uh, realising it needs a whole different pay structure. So some providers are going down that road and let's hope they can lead others to. And then about the wider debate about culture and diversity, perhaps actually the specialist services that are arising in their rarity but they are arising for people with uh, specific needs from other cultures might have something to in a sense destabilize the whole culture of care which largely white British people have accessed. I wonder if actually we need to start again about the diversity of all of us and that actually could be a road to remap the care sector for the next 50 years uh, because I don't think the care delivered to, largely to white British people was ever about the diversity of white people either which Ramsey uh, referred to. In terms of what to do about environments uh, it has to be about breaking them up uh, though you could take a step back even further from that and say you know will any of these environments even be needed you know, will there be a major shift to truly supporting people in their own homes, uh, to live in care in your own home, uh, to actually, uh, you know, it used to be, we don't like the term adult fostering now, but where adults actually come to share their life in relationship with you to support you. Will the care sector survive the next 50 years in its current structures of buildings? I'm not sure, but the, the willingness to, for instance, build houses in a cul-de-sac uh, is still not there. We're still building the monoliths. Uh, and that has to be something that I think is radically changed and challenged over the next 10, 20 years. If not, we're going to be living in them. Sorry, can I, I there's a point I just want to make. Um, I, I, so one of the things that I think that really needs to radically change for, for all of us is, is that we need to stop seeing care in a negative way. If we, if, if a care home was somewhere that you thought, well, you know what, when I get older, there's somewhere I, I'm going to have fun. I'm going to be able to live the rest of my life. I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm going to be around people that I like. You, because, you know, if, if, if you're lonely when you're older, you don't want to sit at home in your flat and be lonely necessarily. But if, if we changed the way that we thought about it and the way it was going to be delivered, people would save for it. You know, you'd plan for it like you plan your pension because it'd be something that you're looking forward to at the moment. The stigma is, is that, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all going to be bad. And so if we looked at it like, you know, and I certainly know that 
but it's, it's not something that has changed my, my my way of thinking. I used to think care homes, oh, but now I think, well, yeah, I want to go somewhere. I don't want to be sort of like 90 and be lonely at home. If I could go somewhere where I could have a studio, but I could go out and be around other people, we could still go to the pub, we could still hang out, we could, and it was sort of a home away from home. And I, I'd say for that. So that's, I think we need to just change everything. Like you say, David, we need to, we need to just reinvent the whole system. Um, yeah, so I guess I just want to kind of recapture some of that um, that potent that potency we just had there, that rich conversation. Um, so I think the last point we were talking about some of the stigmas and trying to shift the culture, um, you know, towards more like speaking about care in positive uh, frame. So I guess what are the steps required to get into that place? David? Okay. Yeah, I mean, nationally, we need a massive PR campaign about all the amazing work, friendships, relationships that go on in care homes. And certainly, you know, there are many care homes I could say that, you know, it would be amazing to live there because the care staff are truly like best friends. And so that that is certainly one uh, great, great need. And I also give Ramses about the loneliness factor, that there are many people, you know, older people, you know, living extremely lonely lives on their own and where a care home could actually be liberating for them. Though that still raises factors about why society is structured in such a way that loneliness is such a major factor for older people. And is, is that, to be answered by uh, living in a care home or not. Uh, I, I think for me, uh, well, I'm, I'm not challenging the care sector, I'm challenging the architecture, the buildings. And what I'm saying is if, if uh, the care sector was truly uh, run on a diversity agenda, a diversity agenda would radically say these buildings are not possible. Uh, that it's extremely difficult to live an authentic, genuine life as a carer or as a person living there. Uh, and the only way is to break buildings down. Sabita? I was trying to unpick it a bit in my head and haven't really got to a solution, but I was thinking, um, in Sri Lanka now, we have um, quite a few, in, and certainly in Colombo, the capital, there's quite a few kind of day centres um, that are for older people. And probably 10 years ago, there just never would have been anything like that. And, and they're, from what I gather from family members who are there, they're very popular, they're well attended. There's always quite a range of stuff going on. It seems quite led by what people want going on that that is there so, you know yoga or you know different newspapers to read and so on and sort of 10 years ago there wouldn't have been places like that they wouldn't have been set up because they wouldn't have thought anyone would come they I mean there's sort of runners businesses you pay a bit to attend you know because the, the expectation always been that people spent people who were older spent time with family members um and I've sort of thinking about the shift in you know I totally agree with what um David and Ramses are saying about making, um, yeah, changing the whole framework of how residential um, places, day centres, care homes are seen. And in Sri Lanka, um, there has been that change. And it's also, it's come kind of more as a package. There's also more kind of like magazines and so on that are around that are very much aimed at, um, at older people with different activities and health tips and so on. And it seems part of a whole um, sort of, yeah, more kind of unified change in thinking um, in at, at, at older years and what people can do and what's allowed. So I think it's sort of learning from that for here. And we have definitely seen many changes here compared to 20 or 30 years ago, but it's keeping working at it and knowing that there's still lots of challenges. Yeah, so is there something to kind of unpick around our culture in general towards growing older? and the general population's attitude towards um, older adults.
Yeah, Ramsey, it's something you said earlier about elders not feeling like they have a voice. Um, is that is that like a, a lack of channels of communication or is that turn of phrase in itself quite institutional and really it's just listening and acting? Why aren't, why aren't elders' needs being met and why aren't their voices being heard? I, I, I think it's culturally, I think we, we have, you know, <laughs> generally we have a fetish for youth. And we, we you know, um, as people get older, seeing the value is, is quite difficult. Um, I mean, you, you see that and you just generally every day say to you know, certain people, what, how old are you? And they go, oh, you know, um, <laughs> no one wants to say their age. But I think, uh, yeah, I think it's a cultural thing. Um, and I don't, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, I could, I think of so many things that really just generally when I, that I see that really sort of make me feel very uncomfortable when I think about that. But it's just general. I think if, if young people don't really know or as they're growing up, it's not that if you don't have things around you that make you feel that not just you can just connect to your nan or your granddad or whatever, but a wider community, then I think that that gets lost somewhere. And then as we get older, we sort of get caught up in what we're doing and then, you know, lives get busy and and it's, it's, it's sort of you know you're scared to have to take on the you know mom and dad you know put them in a home there's a whole guilt trip so I just think we need to learn to understand that uh it's it's okay for for, for us to uh, well I think what I think would need to happen is, is it's much more planning we'd all need to sit down and talk if families or not just generally much more planning about getting older and, and so that people have voices, but I think you, somehow you sort of dissolve um, as you, you get older. People, it doesn't seem the, to, to be the, um, the I, I won't say respect, because that sounds really, it sounds really weird, but um, yeah, the, 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 the understanding of, of an older generation. I don't know if that's fear. I suppose some, some of it might be, might be fear. Yeah, of our own mortality, maybe. Um, yeah, David, maybe you could comment on that. Um, but kind of through your own experiences and what positive impacts have working with older adults had on your life and your your life perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think I think what we're talking about in the end is that it's about the complexity of life, and that somehow there's an ageism comes into play about older people, as if as if they got to being old through a simple life and yet our lives haven't been simple in other generations and it's just not the case. I just had a drink in a cafe where an older woman stuck up a conversation with me and started talking about uh, her meeting teddy boys and Americans in the, in the you know post second world war and, and then she, she began telling her life story which was just as complex as mine and I think we've we've come on to that in a way but it got got a bit institutionalized and that we started to think oh yeah we've got to do life history work with older people but it got a bit sort of standardized uh whereas you know life history in the end is about you know the emotional life we've really all led the relationship life we've really all led and not so much the facts of our life and so i think there's got to be an application towards older people like there is towards the rest of us uh, a, a, an acceptance that there's a sophistication about us all really and a desire in all of us to want to find out about sophistication in each of us in terms of what older people have given to me in my life uh, they've given me a sense of overcoming adversity uh, a sense of the richness of life that there's actually no difference between someone born in the 1920s and me born in the late 50s, that actually they've gone through all the same dilemmas in life and that there still has a huge desire to live, to have joy, to have new relationships, to have fun, and that that doesn't leave you. And that if it does leave you, you know, you know someone who's had a period of depression, when it does leave you, it's critical 
and therefore it shouldn't leave older people any more than the rest of us. And we should see that older people uh, are not naturally depressed, not naturally wanting all the things I'm wanting today in my life. And I've seen also older people come alive and thrive again when everyone else thought the last three, four, five years of their life, they were disappearing and they, were, they weren't, they just needed to be reached. And I think that's a lesson that older people also have given me that if you can be reached as an older person, you can come alive again. So oh, it sounds like you're speaking from a position of emotional intelligence. Excuse the not so seamless segue there. <laughs> but um, could you explain the role of <laughs> emotional intelligence in your, in your work? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've only taken on this new uh, professorial role since October. Uh, and of course, it's the first, as far as I'm aware, Professor of Emotional Intelligence in Care uh, that's been created at York St. John University. What do, what do I think is emotional intelligence and then emotional intelligence in care? Well, emotional intelligence is, you know, when you walk down a street or you're in a shop talking to a, a shop assistant or you're in a fish and chip shop buying you know, take away food or wherever you are, you sense the people who are emotionally intelligent. They are the people who've had to emotionally navigate life and who wear that on the outside of them. They're the people who know that every interaction, including this Zoom tonight, is about something that's about feelings and emotions more than anything else. And they're the people who know that the best, the best moments be it in this Zoom, be it in the conversation in the cafe I just had with the woman downstairs, be it on the train talking to someone, is when you emotionally are processing that two-way interaction with someone else. So I would say that emotional intelligence is about emotional navigation, emotional sophistication in processing. It's about having the sensitivity around truth-telling, not just boldly telling truth, but, but, but being based on truth telling and knowing there's to be a sensitivity around that, that you're not a separated professional. It's just chance that I have a title of professor because only 18 months ago I was severely depressed and there's no them and those at all on vulnerability. And the emotional intelligence and care, I think is about all of that, but primarily is about saying, people's lived experience in care, with care, alongside care, is everything. It's the lived experience that matters. Not the policies, not the systems, not the procedures, not the standards, not any of it. It's, is this care service totally driven by people's lived experience and their emotional feedback on their lived experience? Um, Sabitha, maybe you could pick up on, on that point coming from um, some of your work in mental health area. And taking in how David described it, it's very, that was so beautiful. It was poetry, really. Um, so, yeah, relating to dementia and mental health, and I think, well, and, and life in general, I, I think, I mean, we've talked. Um, a bit, Ramesses used the term about a, a big heart, an open heart and an open mind and using those to, to take time to take in somebody else and what they might be going through um, without judgment and processing that and trying to respond without judgment as well. I think also acknowledging that every single interaction we have changes us in the process as well. So we're not the same person that we were when we join the Zoom, for example, because of what we've heard, um, you know, what we've maybe said in the chat or, you know, verbally. Um, so it's accepting that sort of constant evolving of, of learning from each other and that we are interconnected. So, you know, I, I talk to my daughters about um, the ripples that we create in an act of kindness or act of thought or just an act of sensitive questioning with one person does create ripples and it's it's owning that and I think with the work that I do it's um maybe it's kind of how my character maybe is prone to be that sometimes I think oh is it it's taking it's all taking such a long time and the steps and these steps forward feel quite small but then 
pulling back from that and thinking kind of every time, um, for example, in 2019, I um, secured some funding and I was running sessions around dementia in local Sikh Gurdwaras, mosques and black led churches in Bristol. And some of that was kind of doing talks. Um, some of it was just kind of being there at a table with leaflets and being available for people to come and talk to me. And even if only one person did come and talk to me in, in that situation and ask some questions or ask some advice or pick up a leaflet, um, having that confidence that they, they knew more than they had done beforehand and they would maybe go and speak to somebody else about it. And it does create ripples and therefore keeping going because it does have an impact on people's lives. 100%. Um, and yeah, on that topic of creating ripples, uh, Ramsey, something I know you're passionate about is ensuring that elders live with dignity and humanity in their later years. Um, so yeah, could you could you delve into that, please? Well, well in the later years, I think everyone should live with dignity and uh, humanity. So, True. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I. I, you know, I work in, 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 in the domiciliary care and we also have mental health services and now we have youth services. Um, and I think that, you know, in, in, our, in our mental health practice, what I've found is, is with the, the whole thing about dignity is understanding. So I feel, you know, I see people are afraid. If it's something that they don't understand, they're afraid of it. And I think that it's about conversations. I think if we're waiting for people to, um, you know, we have to, we have to, the people with the voices have to champion for the people without the voices. You have to constantly challenge. You have to, and that, and that, that's all of us. If we want the system to change, it isn't going to change because the government wants it to change and it isn't, and it's, and it's not the responsibility of the people who don't have the voices. It's the responsibility of the people who have the voice. And we all, if we're able, we all have a voice, we can all do something. So, you know, my, my thing is, is that if, if something is, is, is not appropriate, if I, if I see, if I see someone who, who needs some kind of support in any, any way, you know, is, is, is to encourage that. Uh, you know, a story, I, I was on the bus the other day with my two granddaughters and one of them sat next door to, to this older woman. And so they were, they were laughing and joking. And one, one of my granddaughters, they're both born, they, one's called the other one a poo-poo head and she started laughing. And so then she turned to the older woman, who doesn't know, and called her a poo-poo head. And uh, so I had to explain to her at four years old, well, we don't call older people poo-poo heads. And, you know, she said, well, why? My, my cousin laughed and I, you know, and so it's, it was a teachable moment. But she understood that actually, you know, there is a level of respect you have to give somebody you don't know or somebody who's older. And, and you know, it, it, it just made me laugh. She now knows she can't call older people poo-poo heads. But I think for me, it's, 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 I am very personal about it. So, you know, my, my father's 94 and he's one of the greatest people in my life. And so I understand the whole level of respect, but I see things around me where that disturbed me greatly you know, where people have no concept of, of what it is, not about even respecting an older person, but respecting themselves. And so then that then gets transferred onto seniors. And so a lot of, a lot of people do have voices um, and, and they should continue to. And I think that in 2020 to where we are now, people are finding their voices, uh, uh, you know, um, older people are, are, are speaking up much, much more because, we are all our champions so I think that that's what we need to continue doing this is that we need to keep speaking up for everybody everybody's rights we talk about equal rights and and you know if we want equal rights we have to be we have to be the catalyst for that and yeah how can we better support some of those underrepresented groups that you work with um people you know disabled people people of color people from the lgbtqi community uh, Ramses. Um, just getting to know them. I mean, I think that for me, but, but it, it really is about trying to understand who, who, another per, who other people are. I think that one, something I heard in this about was a, a stigma and shame. And I think, you know, we have as a community, as a culturally, this whole concept of shame really debilitates you. You know, we're ashamed of this, we're ashamed that, you know, we're, so much shame is attached to things because Really, I, I think that 
you know, my thoughts are 90% of people don't really hate or don't really want, but it's the stigma that's attached to it. You know, I know that in, in, in uh, people will happily, you know, uh, talk to someone from the LGBT community if there wasn't all that stigma attached to it. Um, you know, why wouldn't someone talk from the, to the Jewish, someone in the Jewish community or why fear again about, you know, someone with a disability you know, we talk about our, our being more, you know, feeling, um, you talked about uh, people feeling a sense of mortality, but at the end of the day, we, we have to embrace the fact that as long as we're alive, one day we're going to die. And so all we can hope for is to get older. You know, that's the goal in life. That's my goal is to continue to get older. It's not to die anytime. So I want to get to 100. So I want to be old. I see that, you know, and, and we somehow we need to try and start to understand that the, the, it's it's not, something to be ashamed of or something to fear. We just want to get there as happily and as healthily as we possibly can. But if we are not fortunate to be happy, or well, not happy, but as healthy as we'd like, then the people around us that are tasked to look after us need to just do a really good job and make sure that the way we lived when we were younger or healthier continues, that continues to the end of our days. We shouldn't have to choose, well, I've got to 70 and, and I've got dementia, so this is going to change. Or, you know, it sh we should, everybody should, must have that right. And we have to make sure everyone has that right. Completely. Um, yeah, like accepting our mortality then allows us to live fully. Um, and yeah, on the note of dementia, um, Sabitha, could I ask you about some of the ways of understanding dementia might change between uh, different cultures? Mm, definitely. Um, so the UE research study, I'm sorry, University of the West of England um, research study I carried out in 2016, particularly focused on three communities in Bristol, Caribbean, Chinese and South Asian communities. Yes. And I was really, I was adamant about um, that when I was um, recruited into the post because in theory, this research study was about dementia and BAME communities in Bristol, and it was an eight month um, funded research study. And I said, I I'm not, I'm kind of, I'm not doing it this way. It's the likelihood is it will be really tokenistic. It will be seen as a tick box. There won't be anything meaningful that comes out of this. And it's this whole, you know, continuing this attitude that BAME communities are one big group. So I managed to successfully lobby so that we would look into the um, um, sort of statistics around population and we would look at three communities that had the largest populations, um, the minority ethnic populations that were um, 65 plus, and therefore we looked at Caribbean, South Asian and Chinese communities in Bristol. And I found, unsurprisingly, such diversity within each community, um, sort of even within them, as well as between the three. Um, um, sex had a, a really big impact and the kind of work that people had done and where they lived in Bristol. And for example, I spent um, quite a bit of time hearing from older Caribbean women, many of whom had worked in health professions in Bristol, whether as, as, as nurses um, predominantly. Um, and there was such a different approach in how dementia was talked about by then, whereas it took me a long time to hear from older Caribbean men about dementia or just health in general. Um, and had a great time in the process, but spent time um, lurking around Domino's groups and in barber shops where I could just sit and listen if people would let me listen but it, it took a very different approach and actually kind of what was a catalyst in um, the men speaking to me at that point was Muhammad Ali had died just a few months before and he had Parkinson's and it was through kind of clump, sort of clumsily and with difficulty talking about how they felt about him going sort of someone who seemed to be really important in their lives but his health condition enabled them to start asking me some questions about dementia and there clearly were a lot of questions they wanted to ask but didn't feel like there was anywhere else that they could go so that's something that's really important to kind of try and address kind of you've got an open door in a way but try and address that gap 
Um, and I found with um, some of the South Asian communities I spent time in, um, faith had a really big impact. So how people of who are particularly of Punjabi ethnicity, but of Sikh faith talked about dementia um, was very different from um, people of Muslim faith, for example. So again, really, I mean, and what I felt was really important in my research study when I when I did some scoping about other studies like that that have been carried out across the UK, what I felt, and I'm, I'm happy if people, someone wants to take me to task about it, but the studies that have been done up to that point, up to 2016, seem to really come up with a kind of a deficit model. So the, the problem of the problem in speech marks of underdiagnosis in many minority ethnic communities is because we have stigmas and we don't talk about it. And whilst I acknowledge we still have a lot of work to do um, in improving awareness, tackling those stigmas, there's also the side of things of people going repeatedly to GP appointments and, and not being listened to because the way that we might talk about things that we're experiencing or noticing our dad is experiencing is not the same kind of language and reference points. So what might be more important to me if I were of Islamic faith was my concern that my dad isn't able to rem remember the prayers that he knew off by heart. Um, and that might be more important to me than say in consonants, for example, um, or, um, you know, not remembering which key operates the front door, that might not seem a problem to me or leaving the, the iron on or something, you know, burning a pot on the stove might not feel so important. So um, one of the outcomes of my um, research study, I was actually telling somebody about this earlier, was um, getting some funding and running some information sessions in GPs practices in Bristol, and particularly targeting those that were likely to have very high numbers of patients of those various minority ethnic communities I work with to um, sort of share with them some of the findings of how, you know, not bothering to think about, well, you, you don't translate dementia into Urdu, let's just leave that be, it doesn't translate. But the, you know, I would say, if my dad was doing this, or if my auntie was doing this, how would you describe those behaviours? And so I've sort of developed a bit of a, a growing lexicon of how that might be described in Punjabi or Cantonese or Arabic. Um, and so, yeah, using those examples when you were questioning, and rather than memory lapses or forgetfulness and trying to work out how you translated that into Punjabi, kind of leave that be. Um, so that's a little bit to share that's kind of leading up to diagnosis, trying to, and, and putting across as far as kind of tackling the stigmas, it's a bit of a clumsy way of saying it, but putting across to people why that would be important to go earlier to your GP or keep going to try and find out what was the root of differences you were noticing. Um, because the earlier you're diagnosed, the more you are able to um, sort of live better um, and longer and well in the way that Ramesses is talking about with dementia and also how that impacts family carers of living better well for longer with dementia in the places that you're choosing, the earlier you're diagnosed and that hasn't been happening in many minority ethnic communities such as South Asian communities, African communities and so on. Um, just I guess just before I pick up on some of the lovely conversations that are emerging from the chats, um, if we could just explore a little bit more um, about the topic of uh, dementia. And David, I'd like to ask you if, um, yeah, what progressive ways of thinking can we apply towards dementia uh, from your work? Yeah, I think I. I think I'm going to look sort of broader. I suppose for the last 40 years of my life in dementia care, I've been advocating a specialist model of care for people living with dementia. So I uh, specialist dementia care homes, specialist home care, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And people can often misinterpret that. The only reason I ever in the last 40 years wanted a specialism was because of the lack of a human rights, human dignity approach to dementia care. And I felt the specialism was needed to create the specialist skill, the specialist models, but the success of dementia care in the future will be when we don't need a specialism for white British people with dementia, Chinese people with dementia, Asian people living with dementia, because actually we've created a society that is truly individualized, person-centered towards each person. 
and towards each person's humanity. So I think that the huge goal of the care sector ahead is to demonstrate that specialism was needed as a springboard to develop the sorts of care and models that we all require any age with or without dementia, a stroke, Parkinson's disease, to create a truly inclusive society. And I think all the things that have been done so far uh, have been done in a way that is in danger of the specialism becoming institutionalized as well. Whereas the success will be when the specialism is broken down because it's no longer needed. You know, the big, you know, the Victorians who were delivering care in the, in the asylums and the workhouses and the poor houses, I'm sure were still decent, lovely, caring people doing their best. And they couldn't have imagined where the care sector would be now any more than we can. And I think we have to believe that uh, all the energy, uh, all the effort, all the dedication that goes in isn't being criticised now any more than when we look back. It's just about having hope for the future onwards. Thanks, David. Um, and yeah, I just want to kind of pick up on some of the, the nice conversations that are emerging from the chat. Um, and I thought maybe someone would like to speak on some of the realities um, of carers, uh, whether that be family carers um, or carers working in more mainstream settings um, and the support that they need, you know, as individuals and how out of date structures are preventing those carers from providing that person centered care. Um, oh. Is that okay if I share yeah, yeah. something? Yeah. Um, sorry if I interrupted, Ramesses. Um, I have a, a, a lovely example of just, just beautiful, a beautiful relationship, but then how the structures make it difficult. Um, a young South Asian man who um, is working as, um, has, has worked in the past as a carer and speaks a lot of um, South Asian languages like um, Punjabi and Urdu and has really um, enjoyed um, being a paid carer for um, a man and, and they share a language, I think it's Hindi, and um, spend time kind of singing old songs and um, um, reading aloud from a book and um, just really enjoying their time together. But the, the difficulties of very long shifts and, and not much of a break in between and then the impact that had on that carer sort of moving on because um and and part of the reason of the, the the kind of the the pressure around how many um scheduled shifts were put in there just weren't enough other carers on the team um male carers um you know quite often from minority ethnic communities are, are, are quite a, a scant resource i believe and um yeah the impact of that and then someone moving on because it's not being able to sustain um, sort of doing something that he really enjoyed because of the, the long shift pattern and the very little breaks in between. Ramses or David, would you like to comment on some of the realities of carers? It is uh, the realities of that is, is very it is very real. It's, it is very um, it can be very challenging. I mean, I think that the the focus needs to, uh, there does need to be a shift, and the government are talking about it now, but. We do need to support, you know, uh, care workers much, much more um, in all, in all, in all, ver in all, in all types of ways. And you know, whether it's supporting their mental health, whether that's expecting them to work different shift patterns, and I think that you will get different shift patterns and 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 a different and and a diverse range of people when you are, when when the profession becomes something that's desirable. Um, and you know, in, particularly in COVID. We see people, you know, come and go so quickly that, you know, they're here, that they're, you know, they're in post a position for, for, you know, two or maybe two months and then, and then they're off to another agency. Um, so it's, it is, it is very, very challenging. And I think, you know, the, the whole concept of zero hours contracts, but in terms of, uh, in terms of giving something like domiciliary care, going to someone's house, you've got half an hour 
got to, to, to sort of feed them, da, da, da. I don't want to say feed them, that's, that's the wrong, wrong terminology, but prepare a meal, all of those things in half an hour. And, so, and sometimes uh, it's an impossible to do. And then you sort of onto the next and onto the next and, on, and it's in winter, summer, rain and snow. So I think really for me, that, that what we need to really do is invest in the system. And that's, in, if, 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 if you invest in the workers, the system will change because they're being invested in and it will be it will flourish from from the from the ground up uh, the top-down approach where we see this all the time that doesn't really work you know we clapped for the nhs but it was for the nhs and we know that caregivers care you know care workers out there support workers that, that work in the independent living semi-independent living all of those people give their time so again you see that sort of you know divide the nhs is, is is quite different from the people who give care and, and 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 what does that make you feel like that makes you just feel like actually i'm not really worth that much and i think i, I so yeah i think a massive in, investment we need to uh needs to be given uh to the to the staff but you know managers again you've got to you've got to you know fit all these these tick tick all these boxes in the framework and is it is it is it gonna you know is that going to, how are you going to manage that? It, it does become really challenging. Uh, yeah. David, would you like to, to pick up on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the recruitment crisis uh, as a result of the pandemic and the retention crisis speaks for itself. There, we have to find a way to bridge the gap between what we expect and I hate the word working, but what we expect people to give and then what they receive themselves from their employer. And so what I'm saying is that the biggest challenge, and it links to what Rams is saying about uh, investment, uh, and whilst it is investment in better pay terms conditions, of course it is, it, but it, it isn't the full picture. It's also investment in what I would describe as emotional labour that actually if you're asking someone to reach out, connect, emotionally be with someone in a, what I've described as a genuine, authentic way that values someone's whole life, that has to come from what I called inside out earlier in this discussion. And that's a huge ask, hour after hour, day after day, shift after shift, unless you're also being filled up. And the work I'm involved in is in talking with care workers, nurses, leaders about do they really feel that they are being filled up enough to give back out again? And I think that seems to be still something in the sector that is still struggled with about what is the emotional labour strategy? for the whole health and social care sector, for all the providers of health and social care, how much are we really gonna apply being person-centered to staff as much as we expect them to be to individual people they're supporting? Well, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, we're nearing the end of this panel discussion now, so maybe we could end on um, if you could shortly answer what your hopes are for the future of the care sector. That's a big ask. Um, <laughs> I will, I will um, funnel myself a bit. I really appreciate and love what David's just um, shared and suggested. And I was reflecting in the, the current um, paid work that I do. Um, I'm, I'm allowed as part of my working hours once a week that there's something put on that I can go to my working hours, whether that's um, sort of a, a yoga class or you know we very much look kind of as a team can someone run something that um, would benefit the rest of the team so whether like if someone is a yoga teacher or someone will do a guided mindfulness or um, health tips around nutrition and you know I'm encouraged to do that in my paid working time at least once a week so it's not my lunch break and it's just about filling me up for my work and what I do is nowhere near as hard emotionally as um, my friend who was going in and singing Hindi old songs and reading books um, with, with the older man even though he really really enjoyed that but it's much more 
emotionally taking from him than what I do. So um, try and, you know, plenty of other workplaces do that kind of thing. So, you know, taking that out to um, people in, um, in industries where there's paid care roles, as, as well as looking at the remuneration of those posts and that long term investment and kind of and starting from a young age, I, mean, I think, you know, despite my area of work um, and talking about it with my daughters, my younger daughter, who's in her last year of GCSEs, I mean, she was she was quite offended when someone said, oh, have you thought about doing health and social care at college? Because of what she thought that denoted about um, her intelligence about getting onto that course and you know she really loves the science she's like excels at science she wants to do something in the scientific field so you know you know it's you know despite me doing this kind of work and them having come into residential homes and spending time in around people with dementia because of me she was really offended about what she thought that was saying about her capabilities and what work she had in the future so we've got an a lot of work ahead of us to change those messages down to the younger generation because you know this is our our pipeline of, you know, of cha changing views about it being something that's a really valuable profession that you need to be intelligent in all kinds of ways to go into and it's competitive yeah i think um i think uh my hope for the future is is that younger people start to get it you know i think we need to start designing games or something apps where they or you know games where they go in and do okay something so that we start to understand the value of of what it is and what we are as people and when we value each other at any age you know we see this with younger people get, get us that can get the same thing that uh, things change so um i think it's it's about understanding and valuing i i think things will change because i think just like everything things evolve david was saying you know back in the you know, 19, whenever they were uh, in asylums, oh, they shipped you off if you had a baby outside of marriage. Um, and it's quite a different thing now. So I think that what we need to do is start pushing for changes and looking for it in, 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 in different ways. One of the things that I want to bring into the, the stuff, the work that we do is VR, um, you know, VR therapies, virtual reality. Um, so, you know, we're trying to make it, bring it into sort of, you know, contemporary times. I think when people start thinking about it, when we start to think about and talk about care uh, and support in, in diff with different language, things will change. Uh, we just need to find ways of doing it. Uh, I think my hope would be five things. That we see that this whole discussion is a discussion about the human rights of older people and, and staff. Uh, my hope, secondly, is that there's a massive celebration of the current humanity in, in the care sector and that it's spread more and more and more out there uh, as an education to society of the ph phenomenal celebration of humanity that goes on in, in the care sector by staff and managers. Thirdly, that the social care sector gets the same respect that the NHS does. Fourthly, that leadership is more focused on compassionate leadership rather than managerialism. And lastly, uh, you know, the other panelists have talked a lot about the need for massive investment in staff. And I hope that massive investment is not in a, another load of mechanical competencies, but that the massive investment is training and support on the emotional resilience of staff. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think that brings us to the end now. So I want to say thank you. Thank you to the attendees for joining us on Zoom. And a big thank you to our amazing panellists for sharing your rich perspectives and insights. There's been loads and loads of food for thought tonight. And hopefully that's just started a conversation for some of the attendees tonight that could lead to some sort of paradigm shifts. Um, or at least we now know why calling an older person a poo-poo head isn't appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so if you do want to keep in touch with ad infinitum or have any thoughts or feedback from anything you've heard tonight i do see there were some people that wanted to ask some questions so apologies that we weren't able to do that tonight but you can email sammy i think 
email addresses will be posted in the comments. If not, I'll repeat them now. So Sammy's email is so Sammy S A double M Y at ad dash infinitum.org. Or you can email Emma. So Emma again at ad dash infinitum.org. And if you're interested in staying in the loop with Ad Infinitum's work, you can follow their Twitter. And that is at theatre ad INF. Or you can check out their website, which is obviously www.ad-infinitum.org, which should be in the comments section soon. Um, so yeah, please do stay, stay connected, stay tuned.